Welcome to worship with Roswell Presbyterian Church. We are a faith family united in Jesus Christ to love with our head, heart, and hands. We are glad you have joined us for worship, and we would love to know you are here. Whether you're a first-time visitor or a long-time member, please visit roswellpres.org and sign our digital friendship register. Welcome to worship at Roswell Presbyterian Church. We are glad you're here.
call to worship. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Would you join me by standing, whether in body or spirit, for our opening hymn, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Please be seated. It is with great excitement that I announce to you and introduce to you our five new members that joined in front of the session this past week. Here in worship with us today, we have Julie and Nick Colbert and their son Nicholas. You guys stand right here. We welcome them. And joining us virtually are Melinda and Bill Freeman and Jane Howland. Julie and Nick join us by reaffirmation of faith. Melinda and Bill join us by transfer of letter from another local church. And Jane Howland, you, some of you may recognize that name. She joins from another local church, but, but she was a former member of RPC and even a part of the RPC staff for a while. We welcome all of these to the RPC family. Welcome, we're glad to have you. As we gather here today as a people of God, we are reminded that scripture tells us that even as we wait in expectation and in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah once again, we do so as sinners. Individuals who fall short of God's intentions for our lives. And that as such, we need to confess our failures because we know that Jesus intercedes for us and desires to freely forgive us through the Father. So let us draw near to God with sincerity and confidence and, and pray together our prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of grace and truth, long ago your prophets told of your promises, promises of restoration and salvation 
We confess that we have not believed your promise. We have preferred brokenness to restoration, darkness to light, conflict to peace. We have remained silent in the face of the discomfort, not wanting to face the hard work of repentance and change. Forgive us and renew our strength that we may receive the fullness of your promise and live in joyful anticipation of the coming Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We receive in this holy time grace and peace from God our Creator, from Jesus Christ our Redeemer, and from the Holy Spirit our Sustainer. So remember, the child to be born is named Jesus, and in him we are saved from our sin. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now as God's saved and forgiven people, let us, whether we are here in the sanctuary or where we, or whether we are uh, viewing this, uh, this service streaming. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another, turning to one another, waving, pointing, however we want to do it, short of taking our mask off, and use the words, the peace of Christ be with you, and responding, and also with you. Invite the Haley family to lead us in the lighting of the fourth candle in this year's Advent wreath. Isaiah spoke to a people called Chosen to a tribe called Israel with the light of hope. Gabriel came to a town called Nazareth, to a girl called Mary with a light of joy. Mary went to a place called Bethlehem, to a stable called a nursery with the light of love. As we light the fourth candle of Advent, we rejoice with Mary, for love has flesh. May the love of this light become a living symbol of the love that we have in Jesus Christ. Come now, O Prince of Love, let us rejoice in this light of love. Well, again, welcome to Roswell Presbyterian Church. We are so glad you're in worship with us today. I want you to know that we will have a number of Christmas Eve services this week. We have space still available in a few spaces in the one. We added a three o'clock and we have a nine o'clock um, that still have space available. Um, the five and the seven will both be streaming if you would like to worship from home, and then um, they'll be posted on the church website so you can watch them uh, whenever you feel like it. Well, today we continue our sermon series 
the living nativity. And we've been exploring what does it mean to see our stories, the stories of our lives, in light of the story of God revealed in Jesus Christ, especially as we look at the opening chapters of the Gospel of Luke. As you may have remembered from two weeks ago, even though they were advanced in age, the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah and to Elizabeth and says, oh, I've got news for you. You're going to have a child. And like Vizini in The Princess Bride, Zechariah says, inconceivable. And Gabriel says, okay, you're going to have to think about it for about nine months and not talk. And Elizabeth was thrilled. <laughs> so now let us continue our story where it picks up nine months later. Luke 1, verses 57 through 66. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zachariah after his father. But his mother said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, None of your relatives have this name. Then they began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue freed, and he began to speak, praising God. Fear came over all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, What then will this child become? For indeed, the hand of the Lord was with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask that in the next few moments, you might be our teacher. That you might shine a light on our lives, Lord, as we look and reflect on the life of Zachariah, Elizabeth, John, and this great surprise, this great change that came to their lives. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know what, what's not going to change about change? It's the fact that change is almost always hard. Take the Copernican Revolution, for instance. Copernicus came up with the idea that there was a basic flaw in human beings' understanding of the whole astronomical system. He said, hey guys, I've got an idea. What if the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, but the earth revolves around the sun? Now, it took him 17 years to perfect his theory. It took him another 13 years to find someone who would actually publish and print it. Even still, it wasn't widely accepted until long after his death. I hate to say it, but even some of my theological mentors vehemently opposed him. Martin Luther said, this fool will t turn the whole art of astronomy upside down. The scripture shows and tells another lesson where Joshua commanded the sun to stand still, not the earth. Or the towering theologian John Calvin, he said, who will venture to place the authority of Copernicus above that of the Holy Spirit? And the Roman Catholics didn't fare much better. When the Vatican damned the, the Copernican theory as both, quote, philosophically false and formally heretical. It's true. Oftentimes, the Bible and religion can be used to prevent change. It can glamorize the past or hold us back from believing a new truth. At the beginning of the 20th century, one of America's founding psychologists, William James, said this, any new theory first is attacked as absurd. Then it is admitted to be true, but obvious and insignificant. Finally, it seems to be important, so important that its adversaries claim that they themselves discovered it. 
Change is challenging. As we saw a couple of weeks ago, Zechariah was not ready to change. He was a, a priest in the service to God and the people. Luke even says that Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were righteous, yet they were barren. They couldn't have kids. In the culture at that time, this would have meant social embarrassment. People would have looked down on them as if God prevented them from having children because of their poor moral character. But as we talked about a couple weeks ago, we have to be very wary of connecting moral and spiritual failure to physical calamity and misfortune. We saw that Jesus, in fact, explicitly teaches that one is not connected to the other. But just because it's wrong doesn't mean people didn't think it. And it doesn't mean that people didn't say it. And when people tell you something long enough, you eventually begin to believe it. Zechariah believes he's the barren guy. He knows who he is. He cannot have children. And when the angel Gabriel came to him to give him this good news, Zechariah says, this can't be. Let me list the reasons for you. I've tried for years, never been able to. My wife and I, we're advanced in years. People our age cannot have children. We have resigned ourselves to who we are. This is our identity. And Gabriel says, oh, Zachy. Gabriel kind of had an informal flair about him. He said, you should listen to more Sam Cook because a change is going to come. And now change is hard, but change is also inevitable. And sometimes when change comes, it takes us a while to acclimate ourselves to that change. Zechariah was mute. He did not talk for nine months. He had to come to terms with the fact, he had to reflect on the fact that he was no longer going to be the barren guy. He had a, a new identity. He was going to have new responsibilities. I like to think that Zachariah was one of those guys who, they're nice, but they're kind of like always talking all the time, kind of stream of consciousness. And Elizabeth was always rolling her eyes at him, kind of like when Courtney rolls her eyes when I'm preaching a sermon. And now that she's pregnant, he couldn't be talking all the time. He had to listen to her needs, what she needed. He needed to listen a little more closely. And that was going to be difficult for him. So Gabriel silenced him. You see, Zechariah was going to have to have a new identity. He needed to change a few things in his life. And when we approach times of change, we often need a little therapy. <laughs> We need a little time to stop and reflect and decide how we're going to approach the experience of entering into a change, into something new. Even the best people in the Bible had to do this. Jesus himself, before he enters into his public ministry, he sent into the wilderness to fast for 40 days. Even Jesus has to think about his new identity as he goes from private carpenter to public prophet. He has to think about this change. The Apostle Paul tells us that after his radical conversion on the road to Damascus, he goes into the wilderness to reflect for several years, to think about his new vocation. I think there's wisdom here for all of us. I was talking to a woman this past week. She said that while the pandemic has been hard for all of us, she said she's recognized a silver lining in it. She said, there's it's been a benefit to having to slow down. She said, Jeff, there's even been a benefit for me spending more time around my family. She said she'd found new ways to find joy and happiness in unsuspected ways. And as we've heard about the coming arrival of vaccines, I've been thinking about what have I learned over the past 10 months how have I changed that I need to sustain that change as things go back to maybe a sense of normalcy? 
I think we would all do well to reflect on what we've learned over the past 10 months and to hold on to the good changes in our lives. See these challenges as opportunities and not to miss them. Because hopefully, God be with us that we don't have to do this again. I was recently listening to an interview with Mark Cuban. You may know him, he's an entrepreneur. He's one of the judges on Shark Tank and he owns the Dallas Mavericks in the NBA. And he was talking about the things, I was really fascinated. He was talking about the things the NBA has learned through the pandemic. You may know that at the beginning, they started a bubble there in Orlando, Florida, where all the teams came and they played games. And one of the surprises of the bubble was the quality of play. Everybody played better. People had a higher shooting percentage. They played better defense. All the teams played better. And so the owners and the league came together and they tried to analyze why was the quality of play so good when there were no fans? It was just the court. What, what was it? And they've discerned and through their analysis that these teams didn't have to travel anymore. They went and played the game, then they went back to their hotel until they had to, to go play the game or have another practice. And usually these teams are hopping around the country from one night to the next. And so they said, how can we sustain this change, this good change? And so they put together an algorithm and they figured out how to set the schedule so that when the Atlanta Hawks go to Los Angeles, they, they'll play both the Lakers and the Clippers in back-to-back -back nights so they don't have to continue to travel, so they don't have to wake up in a new hotel every night. So this is good change. How can we learn from it? How can we sustain it? I think this is what smart leaders and organizations, what pe wise people do. When they encounter challenges, they adapt and change. Here's some of the things I've learned that I want to continue. I want to really enjoy and not take for granted being with people. It's not a given. Never take that for granted again, Jeff. At church, I want to sustain the excellence of our live streaming so that no matter where people are, they can tune in and be with us in worship here. In the Bible studies I lead, I want to continue to offer a Zoom option so that as people are traveling or they're sick at home or they for some reason can't make it to the room, they can still be a part of the community. And number one, I will never ever take for granted going to a concert and experiencing live music with other people again. <laughs> what changes do you want to sustain and keep? How might God have used this time to help you adapt in good ways? I would encourage you over Christmas and New Year's, make some resolutions, what you want to hold on to. Don't fall into old habits and old ways of being. Sustain this good change. Well, there's something else I want to leave with you. Something beautiful about this story with Zachariah and Elizabeth. I want to conclude with it. Zachariah has been silent for nine months. He's had time to, to be silent and reflect and think about his life and the life of his coming son. He's had time to think about the change that's coming in his life. Luke tells us, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him Zachariah after his father. They all assume all their friends and neighbors and relatives come over and they all assume they know the identity of who this boy is. He will be named after his father. His name will be Zachariah. This great man, this great priest, a righteous man. Surely they will name their little son, their little boy after the father. But that's not the case. His mother said, no, he is to be called John. And they said to her, but none of your relatives have this name. Their friends and neighbors are like, hold on a second. Let's check with dad. Then they began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. All of them were amazed. Immediately, his mouth was opened, his tongue freed, and he began to speak, praising God. 
Not only did Zechariah have to go through the, the change of how he saw himself and his own identity, he had to go through a change of how he viewed his son, about who his son was going to be. How many of us try to control others with our own ideas and visions for other people's lives? Who we think they should be when we should be thinking about who does God want them to be? Some of us try to control our children, wanting them to be just like us. Others of us try to control our parents, wanting them to change into who we want them to be. We do this to family members, to employees, to friends. We do this to strangers. We want them to have the name we want to give them. When God says, I know the name I've given them. See, the healthy person releases the need to control and manipulate, releases and gives freedom to others. I know who I am, and I let myself be me and you be you. We become fully alive as we become the people God has created and called us to be. The early church father, Irenaeus, said the glory of God is the human being fully alive. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, has this great image of coming alive in Christ. He writes, a statue has the shape of a man, but it is not alive. In the same way, man has the shape or likeness of God, but he has not got the kind of life God has. See, each of us were created in the image of God. Yes, we are flawed and fallible, that is true, but God has come to redeem us in Jesus Christ to help us flourish and become the people God has created us to be in God's image as we come fully alive in Christ. Yes, change is hard, but it also allows us the opportunity to become who God wants us to be, who God has created and called us to be. I want to close with my favorite poem. I've actually never read it in public. It does not rhyme, you'll be surprised. <laughs> and it's by the writer Charles Bukowski. If you read about Bukowski's life on his Wikipedia page, you'll see that he doesn't sound like the kind of guy that gets quoted in most sermons, except maybe as a negative example. <laughs> he was a writer who published, I think, 60 books, who wrote about people on the margins of society, People often struggling with addiction, despair, criminal behavior. He was known as an outlaw poet and writer. He was someone you did not want your daughter to bring home for dinner. <laughs> but this poem is very different than his other work. It's called The Laughing Heart. Listen to this. Your life is your life. Don't let it be clubbed into dank submission. Be on the watch, there are ways out. There is light somewhere. It may not be much light, but it beats the darkness. Be on the watch. The gods will offer you chances, know them, take them. You can't beat death, but you can beat death in life sometimes. The more often you learn to do it, the more light there will be. Your life is your life. Know it while you have it. You are marvelous. The gods wait to delight in you. Friends, I think that's the message of Advent. God has come in Jesus Christ and waits to delight in you. People will try to call you Zachariah. They will try to call you a name that is not your name. But God has already given you a name whether it's Amy or Ethan or Jim or Lauren, Kyle, Zoe, Jill, or John. God has given you a name. Let us come fully alive in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. And as you close your eyes, I'm going to offer the laughing heart again as a prayer for you this Advent season. Your life is your life. Don't let it be clubbed into dank submission. Be on the watch, there are ways out. There is light somewhere. It may not be much light, but it beats the darkness. 
Be on the watch. The gods will offer you chances. Know them. Take them. You can't beat death, but you can beat death in life. Sometimes. And the more often you learn to do it, the more light there will be. Your life is your life. Know it while you have it. You are marvelous. God waits to delight in you. Amen. Friends, as we pause for a time of musical reflection, I want to invite us all to consider our response to God's Word, whether we're here in the sanctuary or whether we're out adjoining by a live stream. Perhaps we want to take a moment to give of our tithes and offerings online or to consider the giving of our tithes and offerings as we leave the sanctuary today after the service and deposit them in the baskets. Or perhaps consider our pledges for 2021, or maybe how we can use our time and our talents in service to God as the new year approaches. I invite us during this song of response to consider how each of us will faithfully respond in service and in giving to God and to the mission of Christ Church.
Friends, there are many out there who are in need of prayer this day. There are those who are struggling with illnesses or life situations, or they're grieving from the loss of a loved one. As you notice, the white rose on the pulpit area. We want to remember today the family of Marion Walker who passed away this week and who has entered into God's presence and the church triumphant. So friends, let us take all that is on our hearts and our minds and let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we wait with anticipation this day. We are surrounded by the sounds of carols and of hymns and we take in the beauty of the lights that are in trees and on homes, but we still wait. And we're surrounded by voices proclaiming the coming of a Savior, the coming of one who will be called Emmanuel, Lamb of God, light of the world. Help us to see and to remember that through the, the hustle and bustle of this season, a light is indeed again coming into this world. A light that fills our hearts again and again. Our joy, your light, that shines forth the love of our Savior to others. Oh God, we think of the needs of others this day and in this time. Enable us to be present and to be aware of their needs. Help us to provide a listening ear or a kind word to help with needs or to simply show acts of kindness. Grant us patience in these difficult days, O oh God. Grant us wisdom and guide our words and our actions. For those this day who are grieving, we pray your peace and comforting spirit be with them. <clears throat> we pray this day for the family of Marion Walker in their time of grief. For those who are struggling with illness, for those who care for them, for those whose families are worried about them, we pray for strength and for your healing presence to be with them. Oh God, as we began this day, wherever we were and wherever we are at this moment, we all had and have different emotions and concerns and joys that are on our hearts and our minds. So hear us now, oh God, in these moments of silence as we lift those things on our hearts and minds to you the people who we love and are concerned about, the situations that occupy our thoughts and our hearts, or even the joy and thankfulness we may feel. Hear us, O oh Lord, as we pray. Oh God, help us to be the church that you call us to be. Call us to the missions and the people where we may serve you best. Call us to the places in our community and indeed in our world where we can spread the good news of your son to others through our words and our actions and our financial gifts. Help us to shine the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, from this place and from wherever we find ourselves each and every day. Help us to prepare our hearts once again for his light to come into this world, a light that is a beacon of love, of justice, of forgiveness, of peace. 
this coming week, oh God, in the busyness of these days. Keep our focus on the light coming into the world, the light that shines in the darkness, and the light that the darkness will never overcome. For we ask all these things in the name of the one who brings that light, your Son, Jesus the Christ, praying the prayer together that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, please stand if you are able, and let us join together in singing, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
worship with you today. Remember, you can offer your tithes and offerings as you exit the sanctuary or online. We still have a few days before the end of the year for this calendar year. Also, we've added a 3 p.m. service. We have spots at 3 and at 9. Make sure to make your reservation if you'd like to be in person with us. We will be live streaming the 5 and the 7 o'clock service. It will be a joy to be with you in worship and celebrating this joyous occasion of Christmas and Christmas Eve. Uh, Whether you're at home or here, it'll be a joy to be with you. So let us go with the peace of Christ. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love. And all God's people said, Amen.